My name's Frank Stilwell. It's my pleasure to be the chairperson for this evening's session of Politics in the Pub, for which the topic is $100,000 university degrees. We'll be running the auction later on. Uh, but first, we'll, uh, to open the bidding, so to speak, uh, we've got two excellent speakers, uh, both with a wealth of experience in uh, higher education, uh, albeit at somewhat different ends of the spectrum, because uh, Ray Wynn Connell's uh, an emeritus professor at the University of Sydney, and Julianne Robson is, as she describes herself, a casual academic. I'm sure not casual in all respects, but casual in terms of employment contract, uh, which means she's part of that insecure group of university academics that's grown so rapidly in recent years. When I was doing a little bit of background research for tonight's topic, I googled $100,000 degrees, and one of the items that came up was an interview conducted on ABC Radio PM by reporter Matt Peacock interviewing Kim Beasley in 1999. So this concept uh, of very expensive university education has been around for, I thought, a rather surprisingly long time. Of course, you've got to go back to the 80s with some elements of deregulation of universities under Labour Education Minister John Dawkins. But it's in the period since the Howard government came to power, and more recently, of course, with Abbott and Turnbull, that uh, the prospect of a comprehensive university fee deregulation and thus corresponding increases in the price of degrees, at least at the prestigious universities, has become more widely talked about. Christopher Pine, you may remember, who I always think of as a, a bumptious schoolboy, uh, when education minister replaced by Simon Birmingham, who's rather more the nerdy schoolboy, but uh, it seems the position hasn't much changed. And so the prospect of what's happening in education funding, uh, what costs university students are going to bear is very much a living issue following the re-election of the, uh, the coalition government. I actually thought Labour would make more of educational issues in the election campaign, but relative to uh, health issues, they, it took a very much a second place. So we, we need clarity on these issues. What, what are the options? What are the political possibilities? And our two speakers are going to address these questions uh, with, I'm sure, considerable insight and first-hand experience. Uh, the first speaker will be Raywin Connell. Raywin Connell is uh, no stranger to politics in the pub, having spoken here many times. She's a professor emeritus at the University of Sydney and probably Australia's best-known sociologist nationally and internationally. She's been on the academic staff at various universities, notably the University of Sydney, beginning and ending the academic career there, uh, but also at uh, Flinders University in Adelaide, at Macquarie University, and for a while at Harvard University in the United States. Her publications range over a, a, a wide uh, field of class analysis, gender, masculinity, education, and Southern theory, which is a phrase that may not be familiar to all of you, but is uh, a, a means of drawing attention to the need for a worldwide social science that pays due heed to contributions from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, as well as the Anglo-American sphere that is so dominant in uh, Western academic discourse. So uh, please, Join me in welcoming Raywin Connell. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, <clears throat> Julianne and I have a, a bit of a division of labour here. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, growth of the, the neoliberal uh, corporate agenda in the university system in Australia. Um, <clears throat> and she will be talking much more specifically about how that's been happening uh, on the ground in the uh, very recent um, uh, uh, struggles and, and restructuring. Um, 
I want to start by saying that uh, when we look at the what in <coughs> in the um, the name of this session is called the, the corporate takeover uh, of Australian universities. We're looking at something that isn't like a conventional uh, privatisation uh, of the kind where a, the kind where a, an ongoing organisation like Qantas or Commonwealth Bank or something like that is is sold off, uh, or um, something that that is partly in the public domain, uh, like the uh, land on which the cardboard palace across the road was built. <coughs> um, is put fully in the, in the corporate domain. What's happened in universities is a bit more complicated than that, which makes uh, contesting it also more complicated. Uh, but the same cast of characters are involved. Uh, that is to say, the same corporate elite, uh, the same uh, a, a bunch of, of politicians, and some of the same processes, like the very typical way in which neoliberal regimes are introduced, basically by coup uh, from above, uh, rather than through any kind of, um, of democratic decision making. I know very, very few neoliberal policies that have actually been brought in because they had popular support. <coughs> and the um, complex privatisation that's happened in universities is another example of that. Uh, university staff, university students have never asked for this to happen. And yet it has. Well, the story, as Frank mentioned, goes back to the 1980s uh, when a neoliberal policy regime really got going uh, in Australia, largely under the Labor government headed by Bob Hawke. And the crucial change in the university system, although it had been coming for some years before that, uh, came when John Dawkins uh, became minister, the, the responsible minister, and conceived the idea, which was not an entirely hostile one, not, not a a conception that was entirely hostile to labour ideas or to social justice ideas, that the university system should become much larger, uh, that it should be opened to a wider range of social groups, especially working class kids, and that the old hierarchy between colleges and universities should be done away with. So what was called the binary system was abolished at that point and we got a unified higher education system as a result. The trouble was uh, not that conception of expanding and democratizing access to higher education, but the way it was done uh, and the arrangements that were, were set in motion uh, by uh, Dawkins' uh, policies. Basically, the government, national government at the time tried to get a, a large expansion of the university system on the cheap. Um, so instead of a large increase in public investment, uh, which was fundamentally what was needed to bring the non-university colleges up to parity with the more privileged university system, the universities and colleges were encouraged to into a kind of open slather of amalgamations in which the more powerful and energetic ones swallowed up the smaller ones and public investment in the higher education sector as a whole began to decline as a proportion of the cost of the whole system. And that has continued, um, so that from the time, from the late 1980s through to the present, the proportion of university funding that came from you know, mainstream tax revenue uh, fell from about 90% to around 40%. So basically it's a catastrophic collapse 
of public taxpayer support for a, a higher education system. But the problem was even more complicated than that, and even, in a way, more devastating for the universities, because what Dawkins set in motion was an institutional system where the managers, where the, the administrators of universities were reconceived as managers, like the managers of firms. Universities, especially the new um, expanded and amalgamated ones, were treated like competitive firms, were regarded not just as the local branch of a coherent and cooperative public higher education system, which had been the general assumption before, but as separate and competing and hostile units engaged in struggle against each other for resources of privilege, funding, and numbers of students. And because of this, the genuine democratic impulse that was there in the original idea of the reform began to fail. And what we've got now is actually a more sharply unequal higher education than we had when the whole process began back in the 1980s. One of the key reasons for that is the kind of change within universities that was set in motion by this. So that the administrators suddenly becoming managers and being encouraged to behave like the managers of BHP or the National Bank or any of those familiar organisations really did begin to behave in that way. So we began to get a centralisation of power in inside universities, very largely invisible from outside and not very much publicly debated. That centralised power took power away from the broader range of staff who'd begun to get more influence in universities in the 20 years before that, and right away from students, so that the old slogan of student power uh, really uh, withered uh, from that point on. And you began to get inside universities the kind of you know, hierarchy of incomes as well as um, <coughs> uh, organisational power that you have in mainstream capitalist corporations. So at this point, the Gini index, the measure of income inequality uh, inside universities, uh, began to shift. And over time, and this, is a gen this has taken a generation to happen, but it surely has happened, the central management of universities have become you know, who used to be regarded as very close, in, in fact, really were quite close to the working academics and the working uh, organisation staff, um, began to separate off as a separate elite organisation, closed off, literally the vice-chancellorial suite now is locked against staff as well as against angry students. Um, you began to get a social separation between management and the rest of the workforce in universities of a kind that simply hadn't existed before. Now, with this also came a whole lot of familiar corporate strategies for reducing costs and maximising incomes. More and more of universities' income was coming from fees paid by students um, from the moment that the Dawkins reforms kicked in, I think that the first uh, move was to set fees at something like $3,000 a year. Um, and of course, it's ratcheted up ever since. But most crucially, during the 1990s, the higher education sector was redefined as an export industry, exporting services to an international market which could afford, afford to pay for it, particularly, of course, in East and Southeast and to some extent South Asia. Um, but basically, uh, the higher education sector at this time became part of the typical strategy for neoliberal regimes in the global periphery. This is where neoliberalism in the periphery really does 
differ significantly from neoliberalism in Europe or North America. So the, in the periphery, neoliberal regimes look for comparative advantage in global markets and especially for staple exports of one kind that they can feed onto a global market. It's the story of the mining industry and basically higher education became defined economically as a kind of alternative mining industry. In this case, mining the organisational resources of the university, putting that on the international market um, and, uh, and thus bringing a stream of fee income into the country, which the governments loved. Okay, well, in the course of doing this, the managers now very much oriented to a profit and loss kind of thinking about their operations, began doing what corporate managements had learnt to do in the previous generation, that is, outsourcing many of your operations, buying <coughs> resource, buying services on the market, including buying workers on the market. So body hire came into universities, as in other parts of the economy. When we were on strike um, a few years ago in 2013, I remember going up on the picket line to one of the, one of the bunch of security guys who come out early in the morning to give us the evil eye. And I thought, this is interesting. I've never seen these guys around the campus before. So I went uh, at a quiet moment and talked to one of them and said, you know, he's wearing Sydney University uniform. Are you actually a university employee? Oh, no, no. He was an employee of a security firm who had been hired by the university management to do the security work in the name of the university. And, of course, that was highly recognisable because printing and ICT and so on and so forth. Many, many services have been contracted out with the result of breaking the everyday cooperation and mutual knowledge of the groups of workers involved and thus reducing the efficiency of the university as an organisation. That's another matter. <coughs> the, uh, the issue here that has really caught attention is the casualisation of the teaching workforce. Um, <coughs> the NTEU uh, estimates that about half the undergraduate teaching is now done by casualised or contract staff rather than by permanent staff. The universities, of course, don't release this kind of figure because it would interfere with their advertising, uh, but I would guess that's probably about right. Uh, that, uh, the figures we do get are uh, what uh, proportion of <coughs> um, uh, equivalent full-time staff are casualised, and that's much lower than the actual presence of casual labour in the teaching process itself. But also there's a change, and this is sometimes subtle and sometimes absolutely gross and infuriating, but a change in the, in the way work is done within the university. So there's now much more pressure for continuous production, for continuous labour, on the part of, of university staff, much more surveillance electron through often through electronic systems um, of, a, of the kind where you are supposed, in effect, to input your own data and thus, in effect, invite uh, surveillance of yourself all the time. We've become infected uh, by what has been nicely called in the research literature audit culture. Everything that university staff do is supposed to be auditable, uh, able to be measured and tested and the efficiency of the exercise um, thus uh, measured. Now, most of the discussion about what's happening inside universities is concerned the academic staff, but the academic staff are only half the workforce of universities. And I think it's also important to pay attention to what has happened to the other groups of workers in universities. And as services have been outsourced, so a lot of these jobs have been shifted in a way out from 
the direct responsibility of the university itself to the companies, sometimes small companies, sometimes large ones, which supply the service on a contract basis. So that outsourcing of services is also a, a shift in the nature of the labour force in higher education too, which is really quite difficult to contest. I mean, this moves people out um, of the, an employ direct employment relationship with the university and, um, and often into a situation where university-based university unions have no right of coverage. Um, how much this is deliberate uh, industrial strategy, I don't know, but the effect is clear enough. There's also something that, that I've become more and more conscious of and, and worried about, and that is the cultural effect of this corporatization of, of the universities. The universities claim to respect and claim to have something that is worth support, you know, social, uh, applying social resources to support is very much bound up with the university's claim to tell the truth. Okay, university is a research institution by definition and a teaching institution by definition. The two together more or less define what a university is. Now everyone who's worked in research knows that establishing the truth about any problem that you're working on is usually a difficult thing. It involves, you know, multiple workers, it involves time, it involves backtracking problems, overcoming difficulties. It's a tough business. And it's really quite important in research as well as in teaching to be part of, to be in a context where that search for truth is deeply and, and systematically valued. Therefore, I find it extremely troubling to see Australian universities lying in public, as they now constantly do. This isn't, of course, called lying. It's called marketing. And it involves the projection of images as well as text to potential buyers of the university's services, many of them outside uh, Australia at the time that the, the key decisions are made which basically misrepresent what's happening in the universities and what it's like uh, to be um, a, a student in the joint. The, corporate, the, the rise of corporate image advertising and sloganeering of a kind that we see on all campuses all the time now is to me deeply disturbing for a university of all places should be a place where questions of truth are central, absolutely central, and no questions asked about it. And unfortunately, we're now in an organisational culture where systematic distortion and misrepresentation, sometimes just by suppressing what's going really going on, is now standard. And in the the. Uh, uh, this 2013 dispute at Sydney is a beautiful example of that. Sydney University has an online news service called Staff News, which, every, is it every week or every two weeks, anyway, puts out a bulletin to inform the staff as to what's going on. In that year, we had <coughs> what was, I think, the largest and most bitterly fought industrial dispute in the whole history of universities in Australia. Staff News, from one end of the year to the other, never mentioned it once. That's just fascinating how much you know, suppression of reality goes on now through the cultural output of university management. So if we keep going down this track, and it's, I, I think, an extremely disturbing story, which you do not hear from Universities Australia, as it calls itself now, which is actually the Vice-Chancellor's Committee, rebadged. Um, we're steadily undermining the sustainability of the country's intellectual workforce through casualisation, through the, the you know, really terrible damage to the morale of the next generation of, of intellectual workers. <coughs> 
we've shifted the organisational life of universities in a way that invites a deadening of the intellectual life of the place. So we're increasingly pressured to teach by fixed rules within those electronic um, control uh, systems. <coughs> um, where um, the university staff are pressured to be working and on the job continuously so that the peer life, the kind of chances of interaction, invention, uh, developing rhythms uh, and, and creativity is slowly being squeezed out by the organisational changes that are happening. Basically, we're moving towards a situation where universities become on the one hand vocational training companies and on the other hand corporate research services providing research services to those corporate co uh, uh, companies or governments which are in a position to pay for it. And if you scotch tape those two together you get an image of the future Australian university on this track. So, um, what's the alternative? Uh, many, I think. Um, but I'm going to offer my uh, four-point plan to change the world. Uh, the key things that I think would change this trajectory. First is union activism. I think the NTU in particular has become the place where constructive thinking about Australian universities is really happening. We're not going to get that from the Vice Chancellor's lobby group, that is, even if it calls itself Universities Australia. We're certainly not getting that from national governments uh, or state governments to the extent they've uh, kept any interest in universities. It's in the union where the constructive thinking is happening. So to expand the industry union and, uh, and resource uh, its activities uh, seems to me very, very important. Secondly, there is a kind of lobby politics in higher education which can be quite effective. If we want to decasualize the workforce, for instance, that has actually begun to happen in South Africa as a result of mobilisation, principally by students, around the roads must fall controversy. What, uh, one of the key consequences of that was not just the removal of an offensive statue of an old imperialist, but an actual process of decasualization of the University of Cape Town, the leading university in the country. And how much of that will be followed through, how much the insourcing of the support services will continue, one doesn't know. But it's at least a sign that this actually can happen with uh, sufficient mobilisation around it. Thirdly, I think we need a political agenda, and if this doesn't come out of the Labour Party, I don't know where it will come from, which develops, a, a, if you like, a new social agreement around the funding of higher education, much as we had the beginnings of a new social agreement around the funding of schools in the Gon Gonski um, agenda. Uh, we need, in effect, some kind of social compact, perhaps, uh, at all event publicly debated policy about the levels of public funding that are appropriate for a higher education system that is actually serving public purposes and not just private uh, advantage. And finally, we need cultural change. And this is the job that people like me have to do. Um, we need to generate visions of what intellectual life could be like in the global periphery, and this is not just Australia, but the, um, uh, the, the, the global periphery as a whole, uh, given 
you know, the uh, enormous uh, global inequalities that actually shape the way the university system works and make what are actually rather horrible institutions like the University of Chicago, Harvard University, MIT, and so forth, appear wonderful models of what we ought to be doing in the periphery. We, in fact, can creatively generate our own visions of what intellectual life and higher education could be. And the more we're able to do that, I think, the more the nuts and bolts matters of funding and staffing will make sense and have some kind of popular resonance. At least that's my hope. Thank you.